Well, good morning, church. It's great to be with you today. And I want to talk to you for just a moment about how do you keep score? And the reason I want to do that is on Tuesday, I'm going to hand a syllabus to 64 freshmen. And as we're going through the opening pages of that syllabus, what they're going to notice is that I am going to tell them how we're going to keep score in this class. This is what I expect you to do. This is how I expect you to do it. And this is how you will be evaluated. This is how we'll keep score. And what's fascinating is the text that Harrison read. And by the way, Harrison is one of our college interns here. Kennedy's the other one. Uh, you want to stand up, Kennedy, so people can see where you are today as well. Uh, but they, uh, how we keep score and what Harrison read reminds us that there will be a test to this life. And the Bible is a syllabus that tells us how God keeps score. And so this morning, I want to ask you the question, how do you keep score? And because I love sports and especially football, I've got an illustration for you. I know football. I know it very well. I started playing it when I was five. I was so obsessed with it that I would take masking tape and tape the floor to look like a football field. And I had, instead of army men, I had little football men. And that's what I played as a kid on the floor, uh, on the rug. I've always loved football and I understand it very, very well. But last year, my son invited me to play fantasy football. And I thought that'll be simple because I understand football. Football is all about offensive and defensive lines. It's all about defense because defense wins championships. And so I began to play fantasy football with my son and he has to tell me that's not the way you do it in fantasy football. You see, it's people like this that get all of the attention because they can score points for you. And so what I had to do was I had to relearn a different understanding of football. So I could understand how you keep score in fantasy football. How do you keep score in fantasy football? Looks something like this. You draft all these players from all over the league and you have your team and somebody drafts all these players from all over the league and they have their team. And then the games are played and it's not how the games play, but it's how your individual players play that determines things. So what I noticed last year is that the Titans could be doing very well. And we ought to all be excited because the Titans are doing so well. And I'd look around at a lot of people and they were pretty half bummed out. And I was realizing that they were keeping score differently. Because instead of looking at this scoreboard, they were looking at a scoreboard that looked something like this because they wanted to know what was happening in every football game. And they wanted to know how certain players were doing because they were more concerned about fantasy football than about real football. And so this morning, I wanna ask you the question, how do you keep score? How are you determining that your life is a win? Let's pray. Lord, we pray your blessing upon our time in your word this morning. We ask that if we, as we turn to Solomon and to Dorcas and to Paul, that you would bring us into focus with the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might ask how we're going to keep score this semester and into the future. And we pray your blessing upon our time in your word. Through Jesus, we ask it. Amen. I want to begin by telling you about a great king named Solomon. And in Ecclesiastes, he is going to ask the question, what is the purpose and meaning of life? If I was gonna tell you one thing you could do this week that would really help you with the purpose and meaning of life, it would be to pick up and read the 12 chapters of Ecclesiastes. But to really understand Ecclesiastes, you've got to remember something that happened in 1 Kings chapter three. You have to remember that when Solomon became king, the first thing he did was to, he took hundreds and hundreds of animals and sacrificed them on the altar in the temple to God. And as these thousands of animals were going up the smoke to God, 
God was pleased because what Solomon was saying was, God, I need your help. I don't know how to do this on my own. I'm about to fail unless you help me. And God was so pleased with Solomon that he said, I'm going to give you one wish. Wish for whatever you want and I'll give it to you. And Solomon thought about it for a minute and he realized the thing that he needed more than anything else was a wise and discerning heart. I can't do this job without a wise and discerning heart. So God, that's what I want. And God was so pleased that he didn't ask for money or the death of his enemies or anything else that God said, because of your request, I will give you a wise and discerning heart. But notice the rest. I will give you both wealth and honor that far surpasses what anyone else has ever experienced. So imagine having wealth and honor and power and a wise and discerning heart and then asking the question, what is the purpose? What is the meaning of life? And knowing that you could try anything you wanted to, you could go to the French Riviera, you could go to Egypt, you could go anywhere. <coughs> and so wise King Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes begins his search. <clears throat> and as he enters into the search, what he discovers is that the world is like this giant clock that's just rotating around. And what he's saying is we get on at one point and we get off at another and the circle of life just keeps going. And from that he deduces Vanity, vanity, there's nothing in life that isn't meaningless. But he decides, I want to make sure that I test my theory. And so in chapter two, he tries everything. And notice that in chapter two, he is working very hard to see if he can discover how to make himself happy. How many of you have spent time trying to make yourself happy? Yeah. Sometimes we think if I can just get a, a new outfit, I'll be happy. Or if my bank account hits this, I'll be happy. Or if I get that car, I'll be happy. Or if this thing happens, or if I get this degree or whatever it is. Solomon had more money, wealth and fame than any of us. And look what he did. In chapter two, it says, I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine. So I, I, I tried partying. I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself. I collected for myself silver and gold. I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of mankind. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold from my heart any pleasure. And so then he summarizes it. After I tried everything, I considered what I had done and discovered that it was all meaningless. It was like chasing after the wind. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. And so if you read Ecclesiastes and you read the challenges that he has, he discovers that family and friends and a job and food with fellowship with people that you care about, those things matter. But he comes to the end of his story and he says, here's my advice for you on how to keep score. First off, start keeping score while you're young. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble, when the years approach and you say, I find no pleasure in them. He says, start chasing after God while you're young. That's important. The second thing he says is keep score differently. He says, here's the conclusion of the matter. Keep score understanding that you have to fear God. That means to respect God or have a holy awe for God, that God is paying attention to your life and that you are going to have to give an answer for your life to Almighty God. 
So that's what Solomon tells us about how to keep score. Let's turn to somebody else. Her name is Tag Tabitha, but she's called Dorcas. And you may think Dorcas is an unfortunate name. It's really not. It's a terrific name. It means gazelle. It means a beautiful person. And as we read about Dorcas or Tabitha in Acts chapter 9, notice what it says about her life. It says, now there was this woman named Dorcas, and she was always doing good and helping the poor. How would you like to be known for that in your life? Oh, such and such, they're always doing something for somebody else. You know who I feel that way about? I'm not close to her, but I, I really admire her a lot. It's uh, Summer Morris. I mean, she's just somebody that I feel like is always up to something good and helping the poor. And uh, about that time, she became sick and she died. And so they washed her body and put her in an upper room. And the word came to Peter. And he was not far away, so he decided to go and pay a visit. <clears throat> and what it says is that when Peter showed up to visit, everybody was standing around and they were crying and they were holding objects that Dorcas had made for her, for them. Here was a woman whose good deeds were following after her, who even after she passed from this life, what she had done was continuing to make a difference in the lives of other people. You know, one of the things I've heard asked before is, when you came into this world, you cried and everyone else was happy. When you leave this world, will you be happy and everybody else be crying? Because you made such a difference in your day. And what we discover about Tabitha or Dorcas is that she kept score differently. You know, Ted Turner says, the one who dies with the most money wins because money is the scoreboard of life. And Dorcas says something much different. She says, choose significance over success. Do something significant with your life that makes an eternal difference. Last. Let's turn to the Apostle Paul. One of the things that I can tell you about the Apostle Paul is that if he was coming into this freshman class at Lipscomb, nobody would like him. <clears throat> I'm a presidential, no, I'm a trustee scholar. Oh, really, are you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, and I'm not interning on campus. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, a, I'm interning for the governor. And I drive a better car than you do. I mean, that's who Paul was. I can't describe him any other way. He was smarter than everyone else. He was more connected than everyone else. He was clerking for the chief justice of the Supreme Court of Israel. His name was Gamaliel. He was on the fast track to everything you could hope for. Rhodes Scholar, Fulbright Scholar, whatever it might be. He was on the fast track. When he thought back in his older age about his life, he thought, I did everything just right. I was from the right tribe. I was circumcised on the right day. I was from the right people. I lived my life the right way. And I knew the law better than anybody else. He goes on to say, and I was advancing in Judaism faster than anybody around me. And then you might remember that one day on the road to Damascus, he came face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus said, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you fighting against me? And so he writes in his older age, whatever was to my profit, Whatever I thought success was about when I was young, I now consider loss for the greater goal of knowing Christ. What is more, looking back over all of my life, I consider everything to be a loss compared to the greatness of knowing, having a relationship 
with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says, this is what it comes down to for me. I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to share in his suffering. I want to become like him in his death. That's what my life is about, he says. He knew how to keep score. And he knew what the target of his life was. And can I tell you the challenge that most of us have? We don't have a target. We don't know what we're aiming for. We don't know what it is that really matters and how at the end of this life, score is gonna be kept. It reminds me of this. Snoopy knows how to shoot a bow and arrow. But the guy next to him, he just fires the arrow into the fence and then he gets out a paint can and he walks over to the fence and he paints the bullseye around the arrow. So wherever the arrow hits, that's what I was aiming for. Have you ever done that with rocks? My son and I, uh, we have walnuts in our backyard and we throw them at a pole. And sometimes I'll throw one and it won't hit the pole, but it'll hit a tree that's next to the pole. And you know what I tell him? That's what I was aiming for. And we're pretty good about pretending like whatever we hit is what we were aiming for. But Paul says, you've got to know what the aim is for your life. You've got to know how to keep score. And Paul says, for my life, the way to keep score is I want to know Christ. If you've gone to a Christian school this year, hopefully you've gone there because more than anything else, you want to know Christ. You want to know the power that comes from living in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You want to share the life of suffering that comes with service to other people. And you want to become like Jesus Christ even in self-denial. And so what I tell you this morning is you will not win if you don't know how to keep score. When I was a college student at Abilene Christian, I remember there was a Friday in chapel where they announced that Special Olympics was going to be on campus that weekend. And uh, Special Olympics would bring some wonderful kids to our campus and they would play basketball games all during the day. And then they would eat with, with us in the cafeteria. And the cafeteria food at the school I went to was not nearly as good as it is at Lipscomb. A matter of fact, on Monday they'd serve peas and on Tuesday they'd serve green beans and on Wednesday they'd serve lima beans and on Thursday they'd s serve carrots and on Friday you got mixed vegetables, which was everything you didn't eat earlier in the week, thrown all together. So by Friday it was just really hard to find anything to eat. And so there was a cereal line and I always thought you can't mess up cereal. And so I was in the cereal line and in front of me was a little girl. She was wearing a green jersey. And I could tell she was a special Olympian. So I said, hey, how'd it go today? How, how'd you do? And she looked up at me and she said, we lost, but I won. And I thought, that poor girl, she doesn't know how to keep score. You know, and so I thought, well, somebody's going to tease her, so I should explain this to her. And so I began to explain basketball is a team sport. You either all win or you either all lose, but you can't like win and lose at the same time. I don't want you to get confused and have people tease you about that. And she looked up at me and she said something I've never forgotten. She said, no. We lost, but I won. My coach said, because this is the first game I've ever played without losing my temper. Now who felt like an idiot? I pulled my foot out of my mouth and I thought, you have a better way of keeping score. Because what we've got to discover about life is that there are two scoreboards. Just like fantasy football, there's the lower scoreboard and there's the upper scoreboard. And what we want to do is be successful in both. We want to be great at our job. We want to be great at the things that the world thinks are important. 
but we want to remember that the true way we keep score is on that upper scoreboard. Do I know Christ? Do I know the power of the resurrection? Am I sharing in his sufferings? Am I becoming like him more and more every day? And so I remind you of that, that you get to decide how you will keep score in your life. And I want to remind you that there are two scoreboards. And I want to say one last thing as we close, and that is you will never win in the upper scoreboard unless Christ is the captain of your team. If you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you will not win in the life that matters. Because the truth of the matter is we all mess up. We all fail. And our opponent, our enemy, the devil, if it's just me against him, I'm going to lose. But when Christ comes in and joins my team and becomes the captain of my team, then I will be victorious. If you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, you're not going to win. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, whatever good thing ever happens in your life, you need to give the credit to the captain who has made it all possible for you. And so as we close this service today, this message today, I challenge you, if you haven't given your life to Jesus, today's the day. If you're not letting him captain your team, it's time to repent and ask him to take control. But let's live our life understanding that there are two scoreboards and we need to know how to keep score. If you're subject to the call of Christ in any way, we encourage you to come as we stand and sing together.